Hello, and welcome to another Pi Crowdcast. It's good to have you here. We're here today with Pi alum and mentor in residence, Sylvia Salazar. Hello, Sylvia. Hi. Thanks for coming. Uh, if it, this is your first Crowdcast, if you've never been yes. here with us before, Sylvia has been in the audience for us from time to time. Uh, chat is over there. You're welcome to talk and talk amongst one another or chat with me. I'll be paying attention to it so I can watch the chat. And then the easiest way to get your questions submitted is there's an ask a question button right down there at the bottom. And if you click on that, you will not only have the ability to submit questions, but also upvote questions that other people have asked. So even if you don't have a question, jump in there and upvote questions that are important to you so we can make sure and focus this content on the most relevant issues you want to discuss while you're here. So thanks again. Looks like people are still filing in. Um, just to kick things off, Sylvia, why don't you provide a little bit on your background and context on what inspired you to start Tono Latino? Sure. So I am a computer engineer. I had no knowledge about politics. I think it's, I think government was the class where I paid the least attention when I was living in Colombia, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, I never went to school here in the US uh, for high school or anything like that. I came here for undergrad. And so as a computer engineer, I worked at Intel almost 11 and a half years. And then I left in 2015. And then after the inauguration of our current president, I turned political activist and I've been trying to figure this out for the last three years. And this is how Tono Latino was born. Mm -hmm. It actually wasn't Tono Latino at the beginning. It had, that was two names, this is two <laughs> names after. I renamed it twice. It started as a daily Spanish newsletter and now I'm heavily focused on video, which is, I guess, why you invited me today. <laughs> uh, one of our other Pi mentors in residence and Pi alums, Marceau, is responsible for that. Um, he's the one that literally challenged me to get into mm -hmm. video because he said that I was very, I think he said animated on camera. <laughs> I don't know exactly which word to use, but he said, there's no way you could write like that. Um, yeah. My mother-in-law calls me very authentic. <laughs> and yeah, I have like the worst poker face ever. So, and this is something that Rick also coached me on because there was a time, maybe a year and a half ago, I want to say, that I was trying to be very neutral on camera and not mm. let my feelings show. And you, I specifically remember uh, us sitting together at Autodesk telling me, Sylvia, just be you. It's going to connect better with the audience. And that did two things. One, it lifted a huge weight off my shoulders and it allowed me to be me. And I definitely connected a lot more with my audience. And I think that helped with the whole process about video. Cool. Um, thank you. That's super helpful. The the advice to just be you, I think that's that's easily given, but it's when you're first starting with video, it's nearly impossible. I remember you showing me like, oh. here's me, <laughs> here's me being robotic on video. But um, like, how, how do you have to be doing it for a while before it becomes natural? Like, are there techniques or ways you figured out to kind of trick yourself? into being more natural what what's your advice there yeah let's let's oh yes let's mention our sponsor let's mention our um, sponsor reverend nats yes as I'm always. the i don't know how to pronounce saint citron mm -hmm. it tastes nice. like a spanish clara which is like beer with lemon juice and it's absolutely <laughs> delicious if i start talking like sofia vergara from modern family because i had this is my second one so the the question about being natural or like being more authentic on camera. Yeah. It is a couple of two things. You just have to keep doing it. Okay. It'll flow better. I noticed that if I haven't been doing videos for, see, now I get a little bit more because I do Instagram stories almost mm. every single day. Yeah. But when I would have these gaps between the videos, the first day that I would do them again, it would be robotic and it would be like you're rusty. And so you have to give it a lot more 
you have to do a few more tries. The other thing is easier if you just picture one person. So you imagine the camera mm -hmm. as one person or one friend yeah. that you're talking to versus this vast sea of people that are looking at you. Uh, Cause that just feels extremely intimidating and it's like a deer in headlights. Um, so I have one friend that I picture every single time. Her name is Christina. She's a psychologist. I don't know if that is why it calms me down, but she, she's a calming presence in my life. So I imagine that I'm talking to Christina and that we're talking politics and that I usually have my cafecito in here and she's interested in what I have to say. And so I can just relax a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to pretend that it's easy. I, I'm, uberly critical of myself and like if i have like one hair off and then i notice that in when i'm editing it drives me absolutely crazy mm -hmm. i pick on the makeup on the blouse and the thing and how i was slouching but then a lot of times it's like you just have to get the video out so you have to stop producing something perfect you just get it out and then eventually you forget that your hair was off place and whatever. Yeah. I wonder, because this is something I've been feeling and I'm really curious from your perspective, like there was a time not so long ago, four or five weeks ago, where thinking about doing video or a YouTube or whatever, like, I'm like, well, I got to have three camera shots and it's got to be highly produced and I need, you know, Mike's here, here, and here, and it was super intimidating. And now that even all the late night hosts are doing stuff in their pajamas and Saturday yeah. Night Lives doing their stuff from home, like production values have gone way, way down. And it feels to me like that's a real opportunity for us to embrace that lower production value. Do you feel the same way? Yes, and also the quality of our, like, our phones is mm -hmm. way better than oh, yeah. yep. high def cameras before all mm -hmm. of my videos. Now I can do 4k videos on my iPhone. Mm -hmm. That's uh, my iPhone XR. And that's what I use. It's the easiest thing. And oh, I guess, right. I try to or right there <laughs> is my light yep. that I put in front of my couch and I record myself. Uh, microphones, I because of the setup that I have, for example, mm -hmm. And because this room in particular doesn't have any fabric, so it doesn't absorb the sound. Mm -hmm. I have a lapel mic that I got from Amazon for like $70. You do not need that um, for normal things. I've seen a lot of people just, even with a webcam that's on their computer. Yep. And a lot of people are just, they are just looking for the content, not for the documentary mm -hmm. uh, style of video. They just want you to give them what it is you have to give it's it's not a matter of your perfect shots for that they're going to go to vimeo i think is more of a documentary or mm -hmm. movie style kind of thing they're not going to go to youtube or to instagram stories for beautiful scenery or cinematographic poetry yeah. no yep no that makes a lot of sense um i will say something yeah the algorithms in Facebook and YouTube are promoting, not right now because of COVID-19, in uh -huh. other times, they are promoting um, higher quality content. So like 4K video will be promoted more than uh -huh. lower definition video. So okay. if possible, and you will notice that, for example, if you upload a video natively into Facebook, they'll say, if it's not HD, they'll be like, ah, it's gonna reach a smaller, organic audience because yep. you don't have it in high resolution. So I just want to make that point right now because of coronavirus, I believe they're just sharing content and they're not being as picky for the Got it. quality of the image. That makes sense. Um, that leads me into a question about so much of this, people initially focus on the video content, but in discussions I've had with you, there's all of the other stuff you've got to do. There's the captioning and there's the blog post and then there's the hashtags or the or the description. Like give us an idea for doing video at your level. What's the balance of time 
end time management for you? Like, is it 60, 40, 80, 20? Like what, what, what does it take in addition to shooting a video for you to be successful? It depends on the platform. So for example, for Instagram, the Instagram stories that you see, mm -hmm. you pointed out, I have captions in 99.9% .9 of the stories that you see me doing video because a lot of people don't have headphones when they're watching the stories and or some people just are better when they can actually read what the person is saying. So I try to include them. That makes the work maybe 5X in time. So one okay. minute video easily will take me five minutes with the recording and editing. The the tool that I use, I use an iPhone, it's called Clipomatic. I'm sure there's a equivalent solution for Android. Is very good at picking up what you say. So the, the amount of edits are minimal. I would say maybe because my accent, I have to do a little bit more or when I use proper uh, names mm -hmm. like Pete Buttigieg, I remember correcting over and over and over. <laughs> and eventually it actually got it. Um, so it, it takes a little bit more time and it's mm -hmm. annoying, but it has way more watch time than if you did a video that didn't have the captions because people just see you like, right. and if they don't have right. the headphones, they're just gonna close it or mm -hmm. go somewhere else. So it, it does take like four or five minutes for one minute video that you do. Mm -hmm. um, for hashtags for stories, I recently learned, I was doing it wrong, apparently. I was using an old trick that Instagram is poo-pooing. I don't know how to say that nicely. Deprecating? Yes, so before <laughs> you could have, I believe 10 or 11 hashtags per story, but you didn't wanna have that on the screen all over the place, so you would shrink them and hide them behind stickers. Ah, uh, yep. And they would still be searchable, but people wouldn't see them. Now that's a no-no. And what you wanna have is up to three visible, and you wanna use the big hashtags. So for example, today is a Monday, you wanna use the Monday motivation that probably mm. has 25 million impressions Mm -hmm. uh, those are the big ones that apparently you want to use. This is something that I've been testing lately because mm -hmm. that is the new lesson that I've learned. That is not the strategy that you would use in your posts. Um, it takes you less time to research the three hashtags versus the amount of hashtags that you would use on an Instagram post. Yep. So for Instagram, it could be, some days I just don't feel like being on camera. I just, mm -hmm. I do not, yeah. I will do my hair and makeup. I will never go on camera without hair and makeup. I'm Colombian. <laughs> I'm the same way. So that yeah, I, my passport will be taken away from me, I think, or at <laughs> least my, my grandmother will disown me. <laughs> but even sometimes I, I just, I don't have the energy. You, you and I are introverts. This mm -hmm. takes a lot yeah. of energy yep. and it's exhausting and I'm like, I did my hair and makeup and I just, I seriously don't, I don't want to say anything. So I'll just repost things. Because the one thing that I want to tell everybody about using Instagram is you really want to keep popping up in the stories at the top of Instagram. Okay. So the recommendation is to have about six Instagram stories per day. And is that original content or can that be reposting? It could be else? repost. Okay. Because then it's going to yeah. keep popping your, your account mm -hmm. on, the top of the screen so yeah. you're always refreshed versus just com being completely lost yeah. if i maintain that consistent posting i do see a lot more engagement from people um and it doesn't always have to be me on camera for instagram posts video on instagram posts you have a limit of one minute so the the videos on the instagram feed can be only one minute long okay I used to do them with a different captioning service because Clipomatic is only for stories because of the ratio. Oh, you okay. can sort of still use it and crop it, but the 
Apple, I think it's called Apple Clips, does the subtitles and does it really well. Mm -hmm. One recommendation that I have for everybody to save you time, I use captions where they're all caps so that I don't have to worry about capitalization. Oh, I find that to be smart. easier and saves me time versus trying to, because sometimes they just do the, the caps uh, wrong. Mm -hmm. So this saves you time. Um, but it's hard to sometimes get across your, your message in the one minute. If you're recording the video specifically for a post to be one minute long, mm -hmm. can be a little bit tricky. What you can do in those cases is have a longer video and then you just create a teaser where you're redirecting people for another platform like YouTube, for example. Creating those teaser videos in one minute for your other areas. Or the other thing you can do is, I know they asked a question about uh, IGTV or Instagram TV. You can do those videos and you can upload them into Instagram and it puts a teaser in your feed. And then if people are interested in watching more, they can click over. Oh, cool. Um, have you done much Instagram live? Have you mucked around with that much? I do Instagram live every Friday when I okay. normal times for mm -hmm. the Latino founder hour podcast. Yep. I will say a few things. One thing that I do and I want to tell everybody that's watching, uh, one secret that I recommend. So if you are feeling, I don't know, you're scared of Instagram, you don't know, there's something that I've been talking about lately called my ninja account. So this is my <laughs> secret. This is my secret sauce on Instagram. <laughs> my ninja account is not the my personal Instagram account and it's mm -hmm. not my business Instagram account, Tono Latino. It's a okay. third account that I use to test things. I only have two friends following that account. It's a private account and I mm -hmm. only use it to see, okay, how do I test this new feature? Like the first time that I wanted to go live, I did it, but I didn't want to do it on my personal account. I didn't want everybody yep. being notified, Sylvia is going live and then me looking like an idiot. I didn't want to do that <laughs> in my business account. <laughs> I texted my friend, hey, Kyra, I'm going live. Can you watch? And she's like, yeah. And so I did and I figured it out and then I learned a few things and I was like, oh, okay, so this is how you do it. And then I go mm -hmm. and do it. It's like my little testing sandbox. That's and I do that for mm -hmm. a lot of stuff. Anytime mm -hmm. Instagram releases a new feature, I go into my Ninja account and I play <laughs> with stuff and I go back into the real world and I do uh -huh. it. And then people yeah. are like, oh, she knows what she's doing. Yeah, because I played in a secret account mm -hmm. that nobody knows about. Um, and I also use it to monitor how my account looks. Oh, smart, yeah. So you get a different so, view on your own account. Yes, for yeah. example, Instagram has that uh, little down arrow. When you follow an account, it'll show you similar accounts that yes. you could follow. Yep. I monitor that very closely because it'll pick up on like, oh, Sylvia's posting about news, let's recommend these people. And I wanna make sure that the people that Instagram is recommending are definitely the people that I wanna be grouped with. Hmm. That's awesome. That is a great piece of advice. Thank so you. So the Ninja account and just Ninja ask a account. couple of friends that you trust to follow mm -hmm. you, um, make it a private account so that your mistakes or your tests are not yep. public. Yep. And it's, it's a, really easy way to feel more comfortable with all the features of Instagram and not feel so intimidated. Cool, thank you, that's awesome. Um, this, and I wanna get, I, I could sit here and ask you questions all day, but I wanna get to the, the questions from the folks in attendance and this one segues really nicely. Um, how, and we touched on it a little bit, but maybe just like some more, um, some more you're thinking on how do you overcome the mental hurdles of creating video content? Things like self-image, perfectionism, kind of imposter syndrome kind of stuff. What, what techniques do you use there? Because I assume it's something you have to, as a content producer, you have to grapple with this on a regular basis. Yes, thank you, Anthony, for that question. <laughs> I know I was Anthony because <laughs> you asked me on Twitter. <laughs> so as a content creator, one, as a woman too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've, I've ranted to Rick how annoyed I get. This happens, especially on Facebook, 
that sometimes I will post a video and 90% of the comments about the video is how I look and not about the content. And it makes my blood absolutely boil. Yeah. And I'm willing to put my hand on a hot stove that men don't go through that. But if you do, I'm sorry, because it's really annoying. Yeah. However, honestly, very day by day, some days I'm, I'm better at it than others. Ultimately, I have to give myself a pep talk and remind myself, this is not about me, Sylvia, you decided to pick this cause. And this is a lot bigger than you and your fear of a camera. So if I want to get Latin, my mission is to get Latinos in the US to get more politically involved. Thanks to Marceau for pushing me to do video. I think I'm more effective than I than I ever could have been with the medium that I picked originally, which was daily newsletters, in case you missed that. Mm -hmm. It makes me incredibly uncomfortable. It takes a lot more work because you can write your blog in your pajamas with your hair a mess. If you can be on camera uh, in your pajamas with your hair a mess, I, <laughs> I admire you. <laughs> I cannot do that. So I have to feel like physically comfortable and then my hair and then my makeup and the earrings and all the things. So it's a, it takes a lot more time. Mm -hmm. But then I remember, I'm like, okay, what is this about? So yeah, you're trying to convince people to register. You're trying to convince people to vote. You're trying to get them better informed so that they feel like they have a voice in their government and increase representation and da 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 So I try to call the bigger cause. I'm not always 100% effective, like I said, some days I just like, oh, don't feel it. Yep. It's just day by day. I think some days are better than others. Um, sometimes when you're feeling really, really low, something weird happens that I will get a random message from somebody I don't even know. Hey, I really love what you're doing. I'm learning so much. And I'm like, what? The angels are listening to me. I have new purpose. And that just, it's like a, Red Bull with espresso shot just shoots into my base. I'm like, okay, let's get to work. Let's go record. Except now I'm learning, ah, it's not so simple. You have to do a lot more research and prepare. But that's kind of. That's awesome. Um, that kind of, if I can interject one more time here, like, are you feeling, given where we all are, are you feeling more pressure to create more content like is are you having a harder time overcoming that voice that says i just don't feel it today stay off camera like are you feeling like you have to do it because of the situation we're all in that's a really good question i've been frustrated because i feel like sometimes on social media there's this huge push everywhere to like oh you have all this time that you should be using to take courses and do this and do that and learn how to knit and the violin and da 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 and I'm like, um, I feel like I have three more, three times more responsibilities than I did before because I have work. My work as a person that gives information and news is even more important right now. And then you tack on full on housework, right? And parenting and, and, and being a teacher oh, now you've exactly. you're now a teacher yeah. so i am horrible with meals meals are not my thing i would i bless the people and i'm sorry if this is insulting to anybody on the webcast i bless the people that created soylent to me lunch <laughs> gets in the way with my productivity so if i can just be in my computer drinking my lunch that's great Obviously, I can't do that with my child in the house. So now it's three meals a day. Let's be honest. We have not achieved three meals. It's more like two meals and a slack. But still, <laughs> it's really hard. Plus the parenting. Mm -hmm. My daughter is only five, so she needs a lot of supervision and guidance. Yep. And so it, this constant interruption. And the looming thing of like, Sylvia, you need to provide information which makes it a little bit tricky. On the other hand, people are overwhelmed with the amount of information specifically related to coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So even though I touch on that and I, it changes so fast that I only do it on Instagram stories, I'm pulling back and focusing on one thing, 
right now, but or adding one thing. We're gonna keep doing what I'm doing on Instagram because it works really well with my audience. It works, uh, it connects me with the exact target audience that I have, but I'm working really hard. I was trying to do too many things. Let's, let me say that. My mentor was like, Sylvia, stop trying to do a podcast and a YouTube channel and the blog and the newsletter and da -da -da -da. just focus on one thing. So I pushed away the idea of launching my podcast because that's what I was going to do. And I'm focusing on relaunching my YouTube channel. So what I've been doing over the past month and a half has been taking a course on how to make better YouTube videos and plan and for example, record them, recording them all in bulk, scheduling the release. So there will be co new content every week and it'll be more about content that is relevant it, more evergreen content. So it won't matter if they watch it this month or if they watch it two months from now, it's still going to be important to learn, for example, why gerrymandering matters or why you should participate in the census kind of thing. Yep. Um, that's a good segue to jump into this more technical question, which is YouTube wants horizontal video, Instagram wants vertical. Any tricks other than shooting everything multiple ways in terms of repurposing your content effectively? That'll be in the editing. So film horizontally for YouTube, and then you can crop it vertically. It's going to look like, for example, like this, and then all of a sudden you're going to look like this. Yeah, uh, right. If you see my Instagram, my IGTV videos, you'll notice it's the same video that I shot landscape all of a sudden is like Sylvia very tight. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to repurpose it that way, or you can create a teaser in square format for your Instagram post. Okay. So you don't have to do it multiple times because I understand that takes a really long time. Cool. Then I've seen a lot of your teasers popping up lately. Um, yeah. Here's some more kind of hashtag thinking that I think in the green room conversation, we got a little more deep into this. So I'd like to bring this one up. When adding hashtags and mentioning others like at reply kind of stuff, companies or people, what is the best way to determine who or what to add to those captions? Depends if they're talking about stories or posts. So for stories, okay. like I said, you want maybe about three and you want really big hashtags. Um, and it's good to mention other people you, using the mention sticker on Instagram. You can only do one, right. but if you use the text feature, you can mention more handles. Okay. And do folks, just so folks understand, like there's uh, there are two different types of uh, ways to, to mention somebody in Instagram, either just kind of typing it in there, or you can pick a particular sticker that is an at sticker that you can put on. And, and Sylvia, you're saying you can only use one of those stickers. Stickers. Yeah. But you, if yeah. you use the text feature, you can actually type at PyPDX, at Tono.Latino, at, mm -hmm. yep. um, I don't know, Juan Barraza, whatever I know, he would <laughs> find out, but he better be. He's in and, there. The advantage is that here's a question that I get a lot about Instagram stories. A lot of people sometimes, thankfully, want to repost my story. The problem is you cannot repost a story unless you were tagged in the story. Right, right. So if you want somebody to repost your story, you need to tag them. Yeah. The workaround is if you want to repost somebody else's story, you can take a screenshot and kind of tag them so that people jump from your mm -hmm. screenshot over there. That's kind of the workaround that I would do. You okay. can share to your stories, Instagram posts. So it was part of the feed. You can say share the story. And I believe your the account that you're sharing from has to be public, but um, that's the other thing you can do. Yep. Yeah, now, I think you're, I think about, you're right on the public versus private. You yeah. can't you if you try and share a private it won't image, it'll just let you DM it to somebody. It won't let you share exactly. it your story. Yeah. And about specific hashtags for posts, mm -hmm. I gave Rick a link oh, yeah, of I'll a video that, that you can watch. Yep. Because it's gonna there's rules like use three to five 
these type of hashtags, use six to seven of these types of hashtags. So I don't want to confuse people with like super tactical advice, but mm -hmm. Rick can include it in the Yeah, I just dropped it in there. Yeah. So um, there. I do a lot of research with hashtags to try to see, um, and I'm trying to, I'm actually paying for the monthly service from a uh, tool called later.com so that I can analyze what are the best hashtags that I'm using um, mm. to see which ones resonate better with my audience and see if I can find patterns because I'm obsessed with patterns. That's where the Sylvia engineer comes back. <laughs> and I personally shy away from the huge, 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 like, like in a post Monday motivation, Sylvia is not going to post Monday motivation mm -hmm. uh, hashtags because there's 30 million posts about Monday motivation and there's no way I'm going to rank there. So why even bother? Yeah. Um, I get a little bit more specific. I think you can play in the 50,000, 100,000, 300,000 hashtags. That's where I feel more comfortable. Okay. Just test it out. Um, there's a question that people ask a lot about where do you put the hashtags? Do you put them in the description, in the description mm -hmm. of your post? Do yep. you put them as first comment? That's a very common question. It depends. It doesn't really matter. It depends on how long your post is. Sometimes my posts are so long that it, my 20 hashtags will not fit. Mm -hmm. um, so I have to put them at first as first comment. It's just a matter of personal preference. As long as you put the first comment right after, like you have those hashtags ready. You put yeah. the post and you put the hashtags right away. So you don't get lost in the stream. Uh -huh. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I, uh, I've noticed that technique. Some folks have a uh, Zapier, if this, then that, that kind of reposts Instagram to their um, their Twitter feed or Facebook or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of folks will use the commenting feature so it doesn't look, because hashtags on Instagram, for whatever reason, not spammy, other platforms, spammy. Yes. So yeah. like avoiding that if you're, yeah. if you're auto publishing. I think it looks cleaner. That's, but that's a personal opinion. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, oh, this is a great one. And a, and a discussion you and I have had several times, Sylvia. Uh, how do you manage to create content for so many different platforms? Do you make separate content or do you repurpose? Really good question. I've been making it's both. So <laughs> yes. Um, I'm taking a YouTube course and I'm trying to learn more about YouTube and it's just better if you create the content specifically for YouTube, you do all the research for your keywords, your descriptions, your titles, etc., And then you can repurpose pieces of those videos in the other platforms. Um, I will say, for example, you could do the same video that you would upload to YouTube. It'll work better if you natively upload it into Facebook versus putting just the link into Facebook. Mm. Why? Because Facebook doesn't want you to jump off of Facebook to go to YouTube. Right. Facebook wants to keep you in Facebook. So if you just take the same video and you upload it natively into Facebook, Facebook is going to show it to more people. So that's okay. one way you can repurpose. And in, the, in that case, hmm. both of them are horizontal. Both of them will uh, promote the higher quality videos or reward you for having more high definition videos. Now the trick comes like, how do you repurpose for something like Instagram? That was mm -hmm. what we were talking about earlier. Yeah. You can create teasers um, that you can post as as a, in your Instagram posts mm -hmm. or take a screenshot of your, of the screen from YouTube and upload it into your stories. The annoying thing is that until you have 10,000 followers on Instagram, you can't do the swipe up right. link right. to jump off. I don't have that. So you just You're have close. to close. If everybody, very your, close. If everybody like, in chat goes and follows 500. you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm dying to get to the 10,000 by May 4th because that's my three year anniversary of officially starting this whole crazy journey. May the force be with you, but we will see. 
Like I really want that 10,000 by May 4th. Um, but until you get that swipe up feature, then you can just tell people link in bio, for example, or you can create more engagement. If you say direct message me and I'll send you the link mm -hmm. because again, each platform wants to keep you there. So Instagram will reward you if you're having more engagement with your followers. Mm -hmm. So having direct messages, having uh, people react to your stickers or your polls or your questions or direct messaging you, it's showing that you're engaging with people and it's reward. Mm -hmm. It, it builds up credibility with the algorithm. Okay, that's super helpful. Yeah, I think um, one of the places I find myself lacking the most is I'm not very conversational in comments on Instagram, and yet that's a behavior I see you doing is like always engaging with people and always kind of replying to make sure that people feel included, but you're also keeping them engaged in your content. It's well, sometimes I just don't know what to say. Yeah. And it, <laughs> when they come again, when they comment on my physical appearance, right. And it's usually the same people, same men. Yep. And I just say, thank you so much for watching. Right. Sometimes I don't even want to bother with the thank you so much. I just put a thumbs up. <laughs> but if there's a, you know, a comment that's like, ask a question or brings up a point then i do want to answer mm -hmm. by the way much easier to answer if you have a desktop versus doing it on the phone yeah. saves you yeah. so much time in yeah. case people are like well how do you answer so i'm like i do it from a computer i don't do it from the phone mm -hmm. but if you answer to every single comment again like you were saying it improves your engagement so your posts will rank higher it'll be shown to more people blah 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 mm -hmm. Same thing for YouTube. So if you are thinking about doing YouTube, try to encourage people not just to subscribe and to like your video and or your channel, ask them a question, usually around the middle of your video. Mm -hmm. Like for example, if you struggle with not knowing how to do this, write your, give me a thumbs up in the comments or ask me your question in the comments and then you respond to every single comment that's increasing the engagement in YouTube as well. Okay, that's great. That's what I'm learning in my new course. Yeah, somebody did ask, do you, can you tell us what that course is? It's called YouTube for Bosses. And okay. I found it thanks to our other mentor and resident, Miss Casey Jones. Yeah, this and we had, a, we had a piece with Casey. She was one of the first ones on yes. Crowdcast, so you can find her back in the archives or on our YouTube channel. Casey well. is also taking the course. Mm -hmm. She recommended it. I knew about, I had watched the video, the YouTube videos by this woman. I just didn't know her name. She's mm -hmm. Canadian woman with big hair. Her name is Sunny Leonard Doozy. Mm -hmm. She looks a little bit like a lioness, beautiful <laughs> lady who's an expert on YouTube. And she goes into very specific instructions on how to set up your channel, how to name your videos. And not just that, but how to do the research to produce content that is going to be found. So it's not like, okay, you have some ideas about content that you want to make. Great. Now do the research and give me and find the data that validates that your idea is good. Mm -hmm. So look at these numbers using these specific tools to see if you have enough search volume for that topic or if people just really don't give up about it. Yep. My daughter's watching, so I'm <laughs> keeping it clean. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, this is a, this is a really good one. Um, my, they're all good. All of your questions are good. Great job. I just, I really appreciated this one coming in. So my question is a little off topic, but I'm super curious what you see as the future of Latino focused and or Spanish language local media in Portland and what role, if any, you see Tona Latino playing in the future? Really good question. <laughs> that was avoiding. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you because this that's, that's why I'm the host. I ask yeah. all the uncomfortable questions. Really, really good question. Um, here's the problem. 
And I'm going to pull my little notes that I did just in case mm -hmm. this was asked or anything similar. More than two thirds of second generation and 90% of third generation Latinos, so millennials and Gen Z, do not watch Spanish language television at all. Uh, and what they do is digital content. So we are seeing a decline on Spanish television. The role of Tono Latino, I've had to narrow down my audience. I'm focusing on millennials and Gen Z, and that's why I have such a big focus on Instagram and YouTube. Instagram and YouTube are the preferred platforms by the Gen Z uh, people in general. Instagram is the one platform that goes across Gen Z, millennials, and Gen X. So Instagram is the one that they all use. I will tell you from experience, if you watch what I used to do before, all my posts were in Spanish. All of them were in Spanish. And then all of a sudden you, you see a switch. Here's something that is very interesting. When I switched, I didn't make an announcement. I just started posting things in English. I have almost zero backlash from that change because over 70% of Latinos in the US are bilingual. Hmm. So I have to think about ROI for my time and effort. Let's be serious. The people using these platforms are younger, bilingual. Mm -hmm. They're gonna be searching for these terms in English, not in Spanish. So they're not gonna find me ever if they're searching in English and Sylvia's over here speaking Spanish, right? They're never going to find me. I mean, I barely knew how to say half the political things in Spanish. I would have, to, I had like a cheat sheet in my Google docs of how to say all the congressional and Senate committees. Cause I, I didn't know how to say them or things like gerrymandering. You can't translate cause it's a made up word. Right. So I, I do not, I don't want to say that I'm canceling all of Spanish media. There's a lot of things that you can't say it in English. Sorry. Mm -hmm. But for me, I have to think about my time and effort. And so I switched over to English because I can reach my target audience. They, if I even say just a few words in Spanish, they know that I'm a Spanish speaker. And so I build that rapport. If they ask me a question in Spanish, I will answer in Spanish and we have no problem. Mm -hmm. Um, so if they want to send something to their, cause it, sometimes they ask me something for their, like a question from their grandma, their husband, their tia, abuelita, something. And I will respond in Spanish so that they can share. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, I've really received almost zero backlash. And if you see in my feed, in some of my, in my Instagram feed, some of my most recent posts, I did two identical posts on the myths around COVID-19, I think it was mm -hmm. like seven myths about COVID-19, identical content, Spanish and English. And mm -hmm. you will see the level of engagement in the English posts versus the Spanish posts. Hmm. It's like, well, this one gets a ton more engagement than the other one. They're really, I can't justify producing the same thing twice or producing something in Spanish if I'm not gonna get the most out of my time and effort. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for answering that. I appreciate it. Um, I've been holding on one because I knew the person wasn't on yet, but she is now. Um, I haven't done online video for a while, but I used to do a lot of little YouTube videos more than a decade ago. I want to start. I want to start creating more content, YouTube, Instagram, and the like. So, what do I need to know to thrive in this updated online video age? So, are there any like? tips and tricks for getting back into it. Okay, number one, for Instagram, just do it. Just do it. If you feel uncomfortable, make the Ninja account mm -hmm. uh, so you can test in a safe space and then just keep doing it. it. It'll become second nature. You don't have to be on camera all the time. You will notice that whenever you are on camera, it'll get higher engagement mm -hmm. because people are connecting with the person. Whenever I post yeah. a picture of myself, it's very uncomfortable for me very uncomfortable but i do it and i engage with people and i have a lot more conversations and people asking me things over direct message and i'm like okay 
I have to do it. And I have to force myself and remind myself, okay, Sylvia, it's about, I look at the feed and I'm like, it's time to take a picture, selfie. I, yeah. I hate them. Yeah. Um, for, for YouTube though, what I'm learning, um, number one, don't assume that they're all the same. YouTube is a huge search engine, is the second largest search engine in the world, owned by the number one search engine in the world. So you need to use it as such. Everything is searchable, everything needs to match. So if you're gonna use YouTube, do your research on whether your content is good enough or not. So start searching and see if people are, if there's content around it. Um, pay attention to how you title your video. All those things matter. So for example, putting random tags to attract an audience if it's not relevant, bad. You want all of your video tags to be super, super, super relevant to your video and use as much of the tags as possible. You have up to 500 characters in your tags. Use it up to the limit. Your last tag should be your channel name. Okay. So if I make, I was, I was, and I was doing this wrong. So I was putting a video of gerrymandering, for example, and I was putting like, Pod Save America in Spanish. Spanish Rachel Maddow. That, mm. That's not relevant. That's kind of like what the audience that I was trying to attract, but it's not relevant to my content. So I'm actually decreasing the chances of my content reaching people because it's not relevant to what I'm saying. YouTube will scrub your entire video and can extract the captions. They know that I'm not saying anything related to Rachel Maddow. I'm not saying anything to Pod yeah. Save America. So why the heck am I putting those tags in there? Name your video file the same as your keywords that you're ranking for. Okay. Those kind of things matter. So you have to think about YouTube as the search engine and all those things matter. Everything keeps adding up. So it's almost like you, that old school SEO, like yes. make sure, yeah, okay. Boom, 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 SEO. You don't yep. have to worry about that on Instagram, but they're, they're different audiences, you will, um, watch YouTube video for a lot longer. In fact, your YouTube videos, in order to get higher organic reach, they need to be over three minutes long. And remember, the only thing that is higher than a minute on Instagram is IGTV. And to be honest, they haven't been that successful with it. That's why a lot of people think they've not released any data or statistics about the IGTV usage, because it's not that good versus stories or posts or things like you can find a lot of data and information about how many people are using it every day and how much it grows. But IGTV is kind of like, eh. <laughs> not so good. And it's two different things you can connect. You don't have um, to do like your hair and makeup. It's more real life. YouTube will be a little bit more, not documentary, but it'll be a lot more produced, let's call it. Okay, cool. And you Thank have you. to do your research better. It's better if you, prepare your keywords and the things you want to say so that you make sure you say those specific things in your video. They match your description, they match your tags, they match your title, they match your file name. On mm -hmm. Instagram, you can be a little bit more playful. It's fine. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, it looks like we've got time for maybe one or two more. Uh, can you tell me the best platforms to monetize video content currently? Mr. Stephen Green, great yes. question. <laughs> I think, depends on who you are, but I would say YouTube. The problem is that you're gonna have to get to a certain level to monetize it. Uh, I'm not saying to monetize via ads. I think you're gonna get closer with something like sponsors. And it doesn't take the 4,000 hours of watched video like you. It, so for YouTube ads to be enabled, you need to have over a thousand subscribers and like 4,000 hours of watched content, mm -hmm. which I'm guessing it takes a lot. But in my case, for example, I'm already getting approached by brands about sponsorships. So I think that's an easy way. I don't know if they haven't come back to me. I've been asking like, do you want to monetize over Instagram or over YouTube? I'm guessing it's going to be a mix um, because again, it's going to reach different demographics. You can reach 
from Gen Z to millennials and Gen X over Instagram, but it's going to be a little bit heavier for the Gen Z on YouTube. And it's for, you know, different kinds of uh, video. One is going to be short, a little bit more engagement. The other one's going to be longer, more educational explanation. But I would say those two. Do not ask me any questions about TikTok. I am not cool enough. I can watch TikTok videos. I even try, but it's like I don't. I don't think I'm that fun. I'm very serious. <laughs> even with one and a half of these, I'm, right. <laughs> I'm still not like for a TikTok video. I just no. Yeah, it takes a it takes a, a special personality to Marceau. With... I think would be uh, great. Marceau would be great on TikTok. Yes, on TikTok. I, if he's I not agree. there already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he needs to be. We need to, yeah. that's the agenda we need to push now. It's Marceau, <laughs> Marceau on TikTok. That's our new campaign. Uh, okay, let's see if we can get one more in. Uh, that was kind of already answered. Oh, this is a, this is a good one, given your engineer brain. Uh, wondering what you have learned about drop-off rates for video. I just learned this on my um, YouTube course. You want to keep it above 40%. Okay. And you can see that in um, YouTube Studio beta, beta retention, I believe your analytics will say, and it's perfectly normal for a video to start high and drop, but you don't want to see. Okay. The beauty about YouTube analytics is that it actually allows you to watch exactly where they dropped. So you can study what it was that you did to lose them when you to to lose them okay um, cool so it'll give you very specific information about why you lost them mm -hmm. it's normal to have them there um again what i've been learning is don't spend a lot of time in your intro hi i'm sylvia salazar and i created this and my mission is this and i'm going to tell you about this because of da -da 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 -da. no mm -hmm. people don't have time for that they're not here again to watch a documentary or a film of anything. They just want you to get to the point, which is why I actually very rarely watch anything at 1x speed. I have a Chrome extension to speed things up. I don't have, um, unless it's a Spanish video, because Casey Jones told me that Spanish speakers speak like twice as much, and I guess we do, <laughs> as fast as Americans, or like English speakers speak very slow. I just need yes. to speed up. So I, I watch videos at like 1.3 minimum speed. Um, and I already had too much cider and I don't remember what I was answering. Um, but you want to keep them, <laughs> your retention. Yep. So get to the point. Okay. I'm going to tell you about how to do video on startups. I'm Sylvia Salazar. Mm -hmm. This is the best. Just, just make it short and then okay. encourage them to subscribe. And you're going to see a very natural, very fast decline at the end. Cause people know that you're closing off. Right. Um, that's around where you want to tell them about the other content that you have available on your channel mm -hmm. that would be relevant so that they jump. You want, again, it's a whole thing about you want to keep them on the platform. So you want to, if you're on YouTube, you want to promote your other, other video that might be relevant to your audience so that they jump from that one to the next one. Yep. That makes sense. Yeah. And I think behavior wise on YouTube, so many people have grown used to the end, end role sponsor thing that people bail right at the last minute. Like the second mm -hmm. it starts sounding like, oh, we're yeah, going I, into we're going into another Audible ad. I'm gonna bail and not watch the end of your video. Unless here's a trick. Yep. If you are creating a video about topic X and you and you think it will be relevant to talk to promote your other video on topic Y, like these two are relevant, yep. you're gonna tease it in the middle of your video. You put a thumbnail mm. of what the thumbnail of the other one looks like, but th that thumbnail is not clickable until you finish and you get to those end screens. That's the only time, only Got the it. 20, the last 20 seconds of your video is when those end screens happen that can click. Mm -hmm. So you want to tease it first so that they see that thumbnail. And then when your video is ending and they see the thumbnail again, you already referenced that they're going to jump over. Cool. That's great advice. Thank you. This is all uh, I've been learning over the past month. I'm nerding great. out. I mean, <laughs> that's, good. That's, that's why we've got you here. Um, so we like to save the end 
for what we can be doing for you. So we as a community are here to support you. You've been a great mentor for Pi, and it was a pleasure to have you as part of the class. What can we be doing to help Sylvia and Tona Latino? Okay, I have one. If you can help me get to those 10,000, if you like political content, you wouldn't mind following me on Instagram so I can get that swipe up button, feature. Button right there. You can just click it and it'll take uh, you away. That'll be great. My other ask was a little bit more about encouraging two things. One, asking your representatives to support the vote by mail you know, push mm -hmm. from Congress, uh, give them a call and let them know. Again, introvert Sylvia does not call. <laughs> I do not like that. Uh, I used ResistBot. So go to resistbot.io, I believe is the website, um, where it's just a texting thing and it'll send letters to your representatives and then you don't have to talk to a human. All those humans are perfectly nice and very sweet on the phone, but I just freak out when they're like, hey, how can I help you? And I'm like, ah. Um, no, so that, uh, or if you want to be a little bit more politically active, go to, oh, what is the, oh, you have the other the vote link, forward. I think. Yeah. yeah. The, it's to write letters to voters in swing states so that they registered and ready to vote in 190, I don't remember <laughs> how many days I usually have the counter memorized. I, I haven't checked today. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvia. This was amazing. Tons of good information. Really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. And we may we may need you back after you finish the course to give us the oh, the, adv the advanced it. class on yeah. video and that kind of specifically thing. on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> so we really appreciate having you here. Thanks everyone for showing up. Tomorrow we will have our session a little earlier in the day. It is with the first non-Portland person and also it will be our first international pie crowdcast because it's canada but so saul colt will be joining us from toronto if you're interested in word of mouth marketing or talking to the smartest man in the world he will be on tomorrow midday and uh, we'd love to see you back here so thanks everyone for showing up thanks again sylvia and we'll talk to you all later bye-bye